Um, I thought I'd just start by um, giving a little bit background and then show the, that short film. So the movie is uh, about a positive future, a businessman who freezes himself and wakes up again in 2112. This was made in 2011, this short film, uh, like a scene from the script. And here he has just awakened. This scene, this particular scene is not in the existing script, but I'll just give you a little background. Here he has just awakened uh, after being frozen for 100 years. And um, he, he, he is meeting his guide, to, who is supposed to integrate him into society again. So this is just four minutes. I'll just start with that, and then we can continue after that. Why are we here? Because we choose to be. No, I mean, why are we here? In the forest. Nature's good for you. It gives you energy. The trees, the plants, the grass. And the air. It gives you what you need. You've been asleep for over a hundred years, you know? Yeah. I know. It'll take you a while to get used to this new life. I printed out these clothes in the style of 2008. Just so that you can wear something that feels familiar to you. you. Like them? You printed them out? Yes, on the 3D printer. High quality though. Just like 2008. You can print out clothes? Sure, you can print anything. I'm sorry, I'm getting a call. Hello? Hi, how are you? I'm fine. I'm walking my wake up in the forest. My wake up, yes. That's how we call them. The people we're waking up from cryogen station. They need a lot of attention at the beginning. Oh, can you put them up? Oh, they are so cute. Oh, but they didn't have to go. Sorry, I got a call. But where's your cell phone? My cell phone? Oh, you mean my CD? My communication device? It's right here. In my ear. But what was with the waving of the hands in the air and stuff? <laughs> Those are my lenses. Your lenses? I believe that you, back in 2008, you had contact lenses, right? Sure. Well, these lenses can show me images. Like the old computer screens, except that I have the screens on my eyes. And I can move all the images and everything else with my hands. You get lenses too, if you want them. Is it expensive? Expensive. What does that word mean again? It means... It means it costs a lot of money. Oh, okay, no, no. There are a lot of things I haven't told you about our world, but um, we don't use money anymore in this culture, on this planet. You don't use money? Nope. So you could have anything you want? Well, yes, but we don't want more than we need. And I don't need 10 pair of contact lenses. It works pretty much the same way as your old libraries used to work, except that we can keep whatever we want or need as long as we need it. Don't worry, you're gonna love the future. We're one big family on this planet now. Mm. I could talk a little bit about this film, how I made it, uh, or I could skip that and go more straight to the whole process of writing the whole script, which, which now is finished as the first draft. 
um, and talk about this future, which is without money and all of that, and uh, technology and the future plans. I can talk a little bit about uh, how I made this short film. Would you like that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. This this uh, I made um, was made with only me and those two actors and the forest um, with a f Canon Mark II, the ES uh, 5D Mark II, uh, and on um, this microphone. Actually, just thought I showed you this microphone because people are quite astounded with the sound, and I was myself. Just this road mic with a 20 dB uh, um, preamp that goes straight into the 5D um, on a microphone stand. And I had to make the whole um, script, storyboard, so to speak, in a way so that they stood around the microphone. Suppose, I, I was supposed to make the film so that they, they walked through the forest. I tried to walk backwards with this on the camera. It didn't work very well. <laughs> so I rewrote the whole thing so that they, uh, they um, stood still every time they had uh, some dialogue. And the tripod was there. So I, I rewrote the, the story so that they stopped and the microphone was there, and they went around it, and up there, and stopped there, and went to the next place, and stopped there. So it was kind of how they move. It was dependent on the microphone. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of that story. And I filmed it. I didn't have much um, dramaturgical experience at that point. I have much more now. Uh, and also, I broke a lot of rules, in the 180 degree rules, and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, which uh, some people might have noticed. Um, well, anyway, it's possible to do, uh, to do stuff with very, very small uh, uh, resources. So um, the, what you need is t the, the knowledge, uh, basically, and, and good enough equipment. As long as it is good enough, you can do a lot. And then, we can go to how this, uh, this happened, I mean, how this uh, came about. I'll start a little bit with my, my history background. Uh, I have um, been interested in science fiction ever since I was a little boy. Uh, and uh, as soon as I learned to read <laughs> and I saw science fiction movies, all of them was about dystopias and post-apocalyptic worlds. and. Um, Doom and gloom in the future, uh, and uh, I could ne could never understand why couldn't anyone imagine a positive future for for humanity. Um, I uh, in college in high school I, I wrote a thesis about science fiction based on three books: The Time Machine, um, Brave New World, and a Norwegian uh, science fiction book. Um, you know, and there are also basically something has happened uh, on the planet that, you know, it has gone bad <laughs> somehow. And is, is that our fate? Is that the fate of humanity? And um, also with this money system, uh, all my life I felt something was wrong. Something was wrong. I, where did money come from and all of this stuff? And, and how did it work? And, and, you know, I wanted everyone to be prosperous, basically. And... Um, it was actually not until I discovered the Venus Project and the Zeitgeist Movement that uh, um, a light went up, a light bulb went off. So I uh, realized that it's the money itself that might be the problem. Because money is, when we introduce money into a society, we also introduce scarcity. When we introduce money and trading, we introduce scarcity because uh, if it's abundance, you don't need to trade, right? And I just listened to also uh, the, uh, a lecture about uh, scientists who did some research on, on monkeys. Uh, <laughs> it was very interesting. And, and tried to research money and how monkeys behave when they introduce money to monkeys. And they behave like us, very ir irrational. And, you know... Um, and they, they were in captivity, these monkeys. And of course, uh, you had the researcher, uh, you know, they gave them monkeys, some 
metal coins. And the researcher gave uh, the monkey a grape uh, and uh, took a, a metal coin. And then the monkey understood that, OK, I get the grape uh, if I give a metal coin. And then another researcher came and gave them two grapes for one metal coin. And then they said, ah, it's a bargain. I take from this guy instead of the other guy. You know? And then they started to behave like we do with money. But of course, when they're living in the jungle and you have an abundance of grapes, you don't need to trade <laughs> money for those grapes. You know? So and with the, the Venus Project, they are trying to create a future like this. And they, they wanted to make a movie also. So. Uh, when I heard about the Venus Project in 2008, I, uh, I immediately saw that this, this, is, this is the solution, even though it's very, very hard to see uh, from today's per perspective with the monetary system. And I thought that, um, well, uh, and they wanted to make a movie. I don't know if, if anyone have, have not heard about the Venus Project here. OK, two people. Uh, you had not heard about it, the Venus Project? No? OK, so one person had not heard about it. Well, it's basically, it's, um, it consists basically, the, the, the core is two people, Jacques Fresco and Roxanne Meadows. And Jacques Fresco is now 98 years old, and he spent his whole life making a blueprint for a new world uh, with a resource-based economy without money. Um, and uh, I contacted Roxanne Meadows whether if she wanted help with the movie. Uh, and they wanted a professional Hollywood scriptwriter to write uh, their script. And I was not a professional Hollywood scriptwriter at the moment, so okay. Uh, and I suggested they make it open source. You, because then the, the, the Zeitgeist movement was the, the activist arm of the Venus Project. But no, they, they didn't want to make it open source either. They wanted to write it themselves with a professional scriptwriter. OK. And I, I kind of saw what kind of idea they had for the story. I just asked, but she did, wouldn't tell it. And I just asked, maybe it, it's, I, have, I had an idea about uh, um, a girl or a boy uh, with a, a great grandfather still alive growing up in this world. And, but they're living in this future world without money, and uh, we see the, this family's life, and the great-grandfather telling the, his great-granddaughter about the old world, and the great-granddaughter and, you know, shows the audience about the new world, so to speak. Yeah, well, it was something like that, she said. Okay. And then I got this idea. What if, what if someone who are frozen, because they're actually... 250, 300 people today who are frozen, like Walt Disney are frozen, <laughs> one of them. Uh, wh what if one of them or several of them woke up in this kind of world? And if, is, is it an old trick uh, using cryogenics to, to you know, show something? It has been used in Star Trek and stuff. Um, but, but it works um, because then you could show the audience. Uh, what this main character will experience in this new world, because this new world is completely strange to this person. So I came up with that idea. Um, and I was not a professional scriptwriter, uh, and I had made then at that point um, uh, movies uh, for uh, companies and music videos, a documentary, uh, yeah. I hadn't really written a short film before, even. I had writ written, you know, scripts for uh, commercial stuff and, and music videos with no real narrative. But uh, so I thought, well, I could at least. And then I came over this uh, this um, um, competition online f festival, Cinema Out of Your Backpack, which was an online festival and it was a little bit like dogma film because you you were only allowed to use a HD DSLR camera uh, and all the equipment had to fit in and on a backpack so like a tripod and all your lenses and stuff inside a bag I thought okay and it should be a scene from a non-existing movie maximum four minutes so I thought okay that that I can do so I I, I wrote this that you just saw 
uh, I got these two actors. Katini and Sarah wasn't any credits here. This is Katini Nicholas and Sarah Lani. Uh, Katini is from, from um, New Zealand. And Sarah is half Peruvian and half Swedish. And I got them on filmcafe.se. I got like 27 applications for, uh, for, uh, for this. And I auditioned them on the, on the phone. Uh, and they came to Mariestad, where I lived then. And we recorded this, we shot this in the forest there. I cut it, I sent it into the competition, and it got like official selection. It didn't win, but it got official selection at least <laughs> in this competition. So that was the first short film I made. And then, okay, what do I do now? So I thought, well, we should, we should make a film, you know? We should make this uh, a long film, <laughs> even though it's crazy. Uh, so I thought, if, since it is, it, it, is a, it is a movie about a positive future for humanity, so why not have humanity help writing it? So I made the website, wakingupmovie.com. I invited people to, um, and I posted on some zeitgeist um, groups and uh, Venus Project groups and stuff uh, on Facebook, and I invited people in, and I posted this movie there, uh, and I, um, I said, this is, this is the outset. This is, this is the, um, how it starts. So come in with ideas for the, the rest of the movie. <laughs> and it was overwhelming, actually. Many people were very enthusiastic about this, but, uh, of course, not many professional scriptwriters or uh, you know, experienced people was general public, people who were interested. Uh, and the problem was that most people didn't come with any continuation of this idea. They, they came with uh, something completely new from the beginning. And it wasn't like, wow. It, if it was extremely good, then we could have gone for some of those ideas. And I came with, I developed an idea, or a couple of ideas, I think, uh, also a story which I also then, you know, posted. It was all open source um, on Google Docs. And my ideas were also uh, rejected <laughs> from the community. But I had written a lot of scenes that were not stringed together, and it was a lot of material online. And people commented and commented and discussed, and it was so much. Uh, and it never got anywhere. Uh, it, it didn't result in a coherent story, you know, from A to Z. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just put a lid on this and, and see what happens in my own mind. So that was after a year and a half, I put a lid on it, so in, by mid-2012 or something. Um, and then I started to develop the existing story. So I used like a year to develop that story. And then I gave that story to, uh, to some key people, Jonas, for instance, sitting here, and, um, and uh, the community, and it got accepted. And uh, then I started to write the script. I hadn't written a script, but I, before, a full script is extremely difficult. <laughs> um, but I studied dramaturgy, I studied, um, you know, the hero's journey and archetypicals and plot points and beat points and everything, and um, <coughs> developed this script. So, um, yeah, maybe it's natural now to tell you the story. Some some people doesn't like spoilers, but <laughs> as I told him, is this is not a place to not like spoilers because the script is open source, the story is online, the synopsis is online. Um, and I posted it online to the community, um, uh, well, now it's a few months ago now, this year. Uh, it hasn't been an overwhelming uh, feedback like it was in the beginning, because the energy has gone down a bit, but, uh, and I think people, I don't know, maybe some people think that, oh, oh he wrote the whole thing himself. Well, well I didn't write the, write the whole thing. Some scenes there are written by some of the other people in the, in the community, especially, especially one guy who has written a couple of scenes at least, and he has uh, written a book and he has experience. So, 
Um, would you like to hear the story now, how it is? Yeah. yeah. And here is the synopsis and the screenplay. There is a second draft now of the screenplay and the synopsis, so the synopsis is not actually 100% correct. I will update it, update it. And it is, even though it is a fantasy, and from today's monetary perspective, it's extremely hard to imagine. Uh, and it's naive to imagine whatever. But, uh, you know, as I wrote in the post also, it's not more uh, or less, um, uh, what can I say? realistic than, say, um, Terminator or Matrix or Elysium, you know? It's not less realistic than that, actually. It, it, it's, it's just as realistic, at least in my mind, <laughs> that we get to a moneyless future and everybody are happy than the machines taking over and putting us in these, uh, you know, capsules that the machines have done in Matrix, you know? <laughs> so I think it's just as realistic. So, and it is, it is, it is a tiny little possibility that we can get to that future if the countries and people on the planet realize that we can collaborate and that money is a creator of scarcity uh, and that when we start to think differently, um, we can create abundance for everyone. But as long as we trade with, this, with each other all the time with money, we can't create abundance. You know, today we have abundance on the planet. We have an abundance of food, of, of everything that everyone needs, but it's not reaching everyone. It's because we have this trading mindset. That, that, that's the reason. So, this uh, film is set in, um, in the world 2112. It is not perfect then e either, but it is a world where everyone can thrive, and nature has been restored, beneficial technology has been developed and utilized, and where humanity has created a global abundance unmatched in the hi history of mankind. And this world is the framework for the story you will find below, a story we can hope, inspire, and motivate as many people as possible to create a new world, even as it utopian as it may be. So, the synopsis. It starts with Benjamin Michaels, who is um, a cancer-ridden businessman, uh, and he's afraid of death and communism, uh, and he has arranged for a cryonic preservation of his body, planning and hoping to one day wake up again, cured and healed, continuing to the expansion of his multi-billion dollar empire. And he is in for a surprise. So, as one of the richest persons on this planet, he expects to be even richer the day he wakes up again, which he does 98 years later. What he didn't expect. I think we can take some questions now, maybe. I don't know exactly what to say. I have a long list I can talk about, you know, that how the, the state of the movie is now. I mean, the project. Um, I met a producer in London last week and some other people who, who wants to work on it. Um, One question. Yeah? If you think about in the beginning, to make, because now, now you have some negatives coming into the positive future. Did you think about how could, could you do it only positive? I thought about it. It's extremely, extremely hard to create uh, <laughs> drama and conflict. I don't know, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you need to start a topic, uh, but they also have drama and conflict. They go to planets where there are some bad guys or something happening there. Yeah, but I wonder if you have seen some episode where, where it's only positive, like the holidays. Something. You know, the, I saw this, this episode where, um, uh, you know, these actually they find these people in cryogenic uh, cryostasis floating around in space and they bring them to the Enterprise. And there wasn't, I mean, even there was some, some drama and conflict because this, uh, this multi-millionaire guy, he uses the comp panels without uh, permission, yeah. you know? <laughs> you, know so, 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 you, you can still create drama and conflict um, without, of course, you could still have created it without bringing in these bad guys from the past. You could, of course. But um, um, and it 
could of course have made it without the robots also. Uh, but now this is the story, and you know, it's. Uh, I think it works, and it's also done consciously in the way that I think we should be wary about artificial intelligence and robots. You know, we should be. All of the all of the scientists say that. Ray Kurzweil, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, all of them are somewhat afraid of artificial, artificial intelligence. So we should be wary about it. Uh, and so I think it's all okay that this movie ref reflects that as well also. And, um, Stephen Hawking's greatest fear for the future. Stephen Hawking's greatest fear is artificial intelligence, yeah. So I think it's like... Um, uh, I read uh, Singularity is Near by Ray Kurzweil. You heard about that? Uh, singularity is when the artificial intelligence uh, gets as intelligent at, uh, as us, which will, he thinks will happen in about 2045. Um, and then, you know, but to me, it's not really intelligent if <laughs> if this intelligence wants to destroy its creator. I mean, it's unintelligent. I think it's unintelligent human um, logic that thinks that humans are so bad, we have to destroy them. That is, to me, is just illogical. Because why are humans bad? This is because of the environment that we have made. We made this scarcity environment through money and trading. I mean, if you are in the jungle as a, as a monkey and you have an abundance of fruit, you don't trade. It's, it's not much, uh, you know... I mean, of course, there can be some, some conflict here and there, but it's not like this extreme wars going on. You know, it's, it's in general, when you have abundance um, of what, what you need, then you don't get much conflict. But as soon as you start to introduce a trading um, unit, a currency, then you create scarcity right away. You know? That's taking away all the fruit from the trees in the jungle, putting them in the vault, and then dividing out uh, some metal coins that the monkeys sh <laughs> shall buy the fruit from you. You know, of course, you cr create conflict that way. So, so, you know, an intelligent, really intelligent artificial intelligence will see this straight away. You know, that uh, if we create abundance for everyone, which is, which is existing today, by the way, but will exist even more so when we have this, um, uh, well, when we have this very, very advanced technology, uh, will minimize conflict. And it would be no reason to obliterate human beings. Inequality. That's the inequality. Inequality. You know? And it is, it is the trading mindset that creates this inequality. I mean, it should be, it should be very easy for most people. It isn't, but it should be easy to see that the problem with equality and where you have poor people because, I mean, poverty, I mean, poverty creates a lot of criminality and all that. Absolutely. Yeah. Motivation should should go away. And and any artificial, any intelligent artificial intelligence will see this straight away. Yeah. That okay. hey, <laughs> these people doesn't have what they need. If you give them what they need, then there won't be this much conflict. <laughs> it's, okay. it's not. It's not, like, it's not like the machines will take over and put us in these little plastic tubes and just milk us for energy like in, in, in Matrix. I don't think that's going to happen. If, if there's any ounce of intelligence in this artificial intelligence, it'll create abundance and a paradise on Earth. That's the only intelligent solution I can see. <laughs> Anything else is not intelligent. I can't see. So, um, yeah? Um, I'm very interested in all these topics and I'm happy to talk about it, you know, afterwards. I'm not going to <laughs> take over your lecture. But I wanted to... What I'm very fascinated by is that there doesn't exist... I haven't found 
in all the movies of mankind, I haven't found a movie that <coughs> take, takes place in a positive future. In a positive future that uses advanced uh, or modern technology. Uh, every case of, uh, uh, of a positive future goes back you know, to a farming society or, or something like that. And, and Star Trek is in a world where the Earth is a positive future, but it, that's not where it takes place. So, so if I look at it, there is no movie in the history of humankind that actually does this. And I think that's in, insanely strange. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's very strange. And I think, I think, it's, I think, it's, I think the reason is the same as we have the monetary system. People are simply so blinded by it that they can't see anything else. And all the screenwriters and authors around the world are also just blinded by this thought that human nature is, uh, is greedy, uh, selfish, and all of that. In my experience and my um, research what human nature is. It's malleable. It's adaptable. Humans adapt to their environment. So if you introduce money and trading, then they adapt to that. And then they don't act rationally. Just like monkeys in her experiment, this scientist that I was telling you about. So um, if you... But of course, how do you change the environment? Well, some of us has to wake up. You know, some of us has to, to see this um, and, and then start to behave differently and then make it spread somehow. You know? And how we get to this future can be in many, many ways. Um, but the most important thing is that people realize that, well, we are not inherently selfish and greedy, um, but uh, that it is the environment, especially with money and trading, that makes us that way. Uh, of course, we can have scarcity of other things, like for men, it can be a scarcity of women, an opposite, uh, depending on, you know. And I think also this is actually how it started, you know, because we have egoism and fear. Uh, and uh, some people are more egoistic and fearful than others. others. And um, as long as human humans had never experienced um, being controlled before sort of, or manipulated they were easy to manipulate we are still easy to manipulate but the more education we get about this uh, out there people get harder to manipulate <laughs> and there's a huge search you know, online now, now in the world where people are starting to wake up when you see all this Occupy movement and, and Wake Up Sweden you know, websites and so much uh, of activity going on with people waking up and seeing the system for, for what it really is. Um, so it's just an, an, an so much activity going on without money and without trading, but just simply sharing uh, resources and, uh, and um, solutions and information and, and everything. And uh, you, with the green sweater, yeah. uh, the question you asked. Write text messages now. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, that's not why I said you. I just came back to to what you asked. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, um, yeah, about the past, the, the people from the past coming and creating conflict in the future. I think it's also a somewhat, at least, conscious choice because then we see the contrast also between the old world and the new world, which is... That, that was the one, the thing that triggered waking them up. Yeah. How would they... Okay, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so that the audience... Because, you know, if we only had showed a positive future without this contrast, mm -hmm. I don't think it would have such... so great impact on the audience. Because, honestly, this, this film is, is a bit different than <laughs> other, other films. It not, it's not just a movie. It's a movie designed to wake people up. That was the whole purpose of it from the beginning. And, and uh, you know, 
I think the best way to do that is to show this contrast, uh, but set it in the positive world. Because, you know, you have a lot of movies where the hero is the positive guy, so to speak, the protagonist, uh, and has to fight against a bad system, you know? Like in Avatar or in... Uh, well, so many movies are like that, where he find or her, she finds herself like in, uh, in Elysium or in Matrix, you know, finds himself in this dystopic world and has to fight it, you know. Because this person, this protagonist, he or she is a good guy, you know. He knows what uh, the good world is supposed to be. But you don't see a good world. You never see a good world. You see a bad world that has to be changed. You, so you get this contrast, which is important. But in Waking Up, it's turned upside down. You have a good world, and you get a person from the future, from the past, sorry, uh, waking up in this world. The protagonist is not the super, super bad guy, because uh, that would be too difficult to identify with, so it's another wake up. He's the antagonist, so to speak. Uh, but in the beginning, the, the world is kind of the antagonist for the, for the pro protagonist, for Ben. I mean, to him, this world is threatening. So he, he's, he's contemplating to kill himself, throw himself off the freedom tower. But then he wakes up to see how beautiful this new world is. And uh, Peter becomes the antagonist, so to speak. So. You thought about making uh, like a, just a short scene in the beginning where, where he from now to then like step wise we take away like uh, scatter paradise first we remove all of those and then we stabilize the economy and then step, step, step. if I thought about doing that in the in the film? In the film yeah, I'm just to yeah yeah well it's <coughs> two two instances where, where Ben gets an introduction to this new world and how it changed. Uh, one is in the beginning when he Awina bring, brings him back to this the wake up center. There he there uh, you know several wake ups get introductions every day you know to this new world. So they are shown some kind of holographic introduction with a guy who talks about how it changed from the old world into this you know. So there, but exactly how it, how it happened, I don't know. No one knows. Uh, there's there's something online now written there too long it has to be shortened you know so this is something we have to work on exactly what what this presenter says in this introduction to this new world the other instance is when ben meets amo for the second time and he understands that she is his daughter you know she's lived through through these all of these changes so she tells her story to him how it happened to her and how the world changed so two instances, but you know, I, I don't think we should tell the audience too much, because uh, we don't know how it happens anyway, but we can give some hints, yeah. you know, like, you know, restructuring the economy, maybe basic income is a part of it, uh, there are gift economy communities popping up around the world now, and people simply just, you know, just starting to, to uh, grow their own food, and, uh, and instead of, you know, instead of trading it away, they're just giving it away and just sharing it in the gift economy and of course you got um, you got the prices of technology going down and down and down and down and down you know, something like this, ten years ago would have cost like 100,000 kroners or something like that, you know <laughs> now it's, uh, now everyone can buy it, you know and they give them away, so, huh? they give them away. They give them away you know, so eventually things get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and of course, you got um, automation also taking people's jobs. It happens more and more and more, and it's going to happen even more. And, 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 you know, at at one point, humanity is just forced to to think differently. You know, that you, you everyone cannot have a job. There are not jobs for everyone, so that everyone can keep the economy going. And when enough people are replaced by technology, I mean, uh, it's it's going to collapse because. Uh, it is the consumers that keeps the wheels running, 
that we have to buy and buy and buy and buy and buy. Uh, and when people don't have jobs, they don't have money to buy the products that are produced by the automated factories, you know? So at one point, you just have to think differently. And then you can, of course, start with basic income, that everyone gets some income uh, every month, that they can buy the products. Uh, but eventually, you know, I think when, when you start with base, basic income, that also will free people to do projects that they have maybe thought about for years. And I, I, think, I think many people would, would choose then to, to do a lot of voluntary work, that you know that is no profit in it, but they love doing it, you know, and they can still pay their rent. They can still travel and do stuff because they get some basic income. And you know, when people more and more people start to do more and more voluntary work, when some at some point there have to be some light, you know, going off in, you know, politicians and uh, corporate executives and like, ding, well. <sighs> Maybe, we're, maybe we don't need to sell our products anymore. Maybe we should just go together and create the best possible plan for everyone. You know? So exactly how it happens, well, we can't know. But, you know, this, these are some of the things that I think will contribute to it. I can continue talking about the project, the state it is in now, financing. Would you like me to? Yeah. yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whew. I mean, it's paradox, you know. This is a movie about a moneyless future, and we still make, need money to make it, unfortunately. I would have loved to make the whole movie just resource-based without money. But, I mean, I would also love this movie to be as widely distributed as possible. And me, uh, I'm not a bondable director, as the producer called me. Well, <laughs> uh, so, you know, investors need a bondable director. They need a director who have directed feature films before so that they can um, uh, feel sh certain that he will finish it and it will be good. And, uh, you know, I'd love to direct it, uh, and I'm going to make a short film now, you know, getting more experience and showing that I hopefully can direct more, uh, but I, I'm, I'm in no way going to stand in the way of any more experienced director, of course, uh, who, who would like to direct it, or hopefully then maybe co-direct it with that person. But since I um, launched the first draft and a new website, things have happened. It's like, you know, it's like Something is going on in the cosmos, <laughs> the universe, that seems to want this film to be made, you know. Um, one thing that happened was that um, uh, some couple of years ago, I filmed um, Douglas Mallet. If you heard about him, he's a bit prominent in the resource-based economy. He had some lectures in Norway, and I filmed him there. And he has been having lectures in different countries. And uh, so I know him, and uh, he knows about Waking Up Movie, and he's been in the Waking Up community for a while. And he knows this other woman who comes to him, Heather, Heather Odom, uh, saying that she, she, she would love to make a movie about a positive future. And he's like, well, my friend Harold is making one. So they put, it, put us in touch, and uh, so, well, she's 59, and she's not experience in movie making, but she actually booked the whole Venus Project world tour in 2010. And actually in 2010, I was in Stockholm filming Shaq and Roxanne uh, and interviewing them. And I didn't meet Heather then, but she was there. Um, and now I made her a project manager. She's not really a project manager, but she's been a sparring partner for the last month, since the last summer. And she also has some contacts uh, with some people in, in the UK, and some groups uh, who are kind of collaborating uh, in a kind of a network thing with some global conference calls and entrepreneurship and a lot of stuff like that. 
Um, so that's one thing. Uh, and they are also, uh, these people have said they, they like to help with the Waking Up movie. Uh, if it's going to happen with them, I don't know, but uh, we'll see. They are not movie producers, but one of the guys, the main guy there, Jack, he says his brother runs a financing company that has financed uh, movies. The last one was Interstellar, so, okay. It's just too wild for me to kind of uh, believe it, but we'll see. <laughs> Uh, and I started to do something on my own, and uh, I uh, advertised in the shootingpeople.org, which is the English equivalent of um, filmcafe.se, where you can find actors and producers and stuff. Ask and, and um, have you heard about uh, good pitch? Good pitch? Good pitch. No, that's a new one. Yeah, it's a place where you can actually find the interest, interested partners. Or Ah. I'll take a note of that. The good pitch? The good pitch? Yeah. Potch. Check I'll check it out. Yeah. At least I found this um, producer guy in the UK, uh, Lee Warren. So I got like seven answers on the producer uh, ad. And he has produced, directed and produced one feature film and a couple of TV series and stuff. And he also has works for financial companies making videos for them and they actually finance films. So, and his last TV series is the diametrically opposite of Waking Up. It's called Dystopia. So. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, we're not sure if he's the right. I mean, he's, I'm just being extremely open. I'm a rookie, and I'm having this extremely steep learning curve now about um, the movie industry and contracts and everything. Tomorrow I'm going to have a talk with uh, an English uh, attorney also who gives me an hour for free uh, in terms of uh, negotiating with Lee and stuff like that. Um, and... Uh, also, I went to London last week and I met Lee and I met this Jack person and Heather and also she brought in some more people and a Dill guy who is going to make a logo and an electronic press kit for free. And um, there's so, so much things happening that I'm completely overwhelmed myself. I'm going to try to look for some development money so that hopefully maybe I don't have to do corporate work or else I'll just have to get some corporate work because I don't... <laughs> <laughs> have any more money now? Um, so, um, and uh, we're thinking, you know, in terms of financing this movie, hopefully, maybe do it a bit differently than normal movies. I don't know exactly how movies are financed. I mean, you got, you got the Swedish Film Institute, Norwegian Film Institute, you know, English Film Institute, uh, British uh, the institutes in the different countries with funds. You got the Euro Images, of course. We will apply for, for all of those eventually. Um, and, uh, but we think also maybe we can find philanthropists uh, that will support this, donate, and have crowdfunding, uh, and also sponsors. Uh, I, I see no problem in, in bringing in sponsors here because uh, sponsors that have technology, prequels to the technology that's shown in the movie, like Microsoft's HoloLens, if you heard about that. Microsoft now has glasses that you can put on you with headset and transparent glasses that uh, projects a virtual reality around you. So, and that you can have a, like a screen over there that stays there, even though you move your head, but it's not there. And you can have three-dimensional things being built in front of you, and you can go and change it with your hands. Um, you know? And I think Going to companies uh, and saying that, hey, we're making this future movie. Here we have lenses. It's uh, the pre prequel. For, that's what happens after your HoloLens, you know? People have lenses on their eyes. And go to Google also and, you know, say that. Uh, and this, this is a, a future where we don't use money anymore. Because that will make them aware of this future, this possibility, you know? So I think that's good. And so that they can um, 
be a part of sponsoring this movie. I think it's a possibility. And also, in one scene, Ben is, when he goes from the hospital to, uh, to New York City again, he's asked if he likes to go by land or by air. Oh, no, land, land. No. He just like flying. So then an uh, auto car, automatic car, comes driving up. And doors open, and he gets in. There's no one is there, but, uh, you know. And, you know, the Google car is automatic now. Mercedes has a prototype now for, for an auto automatic car without steering wheel. So, you know, we can, we can use this. Maybe it's a Mercedes <laughs> logo on the front of that car. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, at least, uh, you know, the sponsors can have their names in the credits, at least. And, you know, you can think that, oh, it's a sellout. But uh, I think we, we need to get the whole world into this. All the technological companies and car make manufacturers and everyone. Uh, you know, if we're not getting everyone in on creating this world, it's not going to happen. So it cannot be like one little group creating this world over there. It can, of course. But then, you know, what about the rest of humanity? I'd like all of us to, you know, just collaborate and create this. The car companies, everyone. And, and, uh, and then just... Uh, so they can realize, so, you know, like Apple and Samsung doesn't have to be in these fucking lawsuits <laughs> all the time, you know? Just like, you know, Elon Musk, he's, he's starting to get it, you know? He's, he's making the whole Tesla patents, all of it, open source. And um, the Hyperloop, speaking about the Hyperloop, you know, Ben goes in a Hyperloop, you know, from his, the, the car that he goes in, merges with the Hyperloop, and just goes straight to New York. You know, so he can also sponsor, you know? So, I'm sorry, the Hyperloop, uh, well, it's um, a semi-vacuum tube uh, with a train inside going on maglevs and a huge propeller in front that sucks in the little air that's there and blows it out in the back while it's sliding frictionless on the... So <coughs> that, that's, that's uh, Elon Musk's uh, uh, answer to the... ET3, which is uh, evacuated tube, transport tubes, yeah. transport tubes or something, which is a total vacuum inside these tubes. Uh, he realized that total vacuum is too difficult to obtain because if you get a leak somewhere, you know, you don't have a vacuum. So instead, he, he made this Hyperloop thing, which is open source, and uh, that people are, uh, you know, working on on their spare time, scientists. So, um... And that was uh, sponsorship and uh, the state of the project at the moment. Something I forgot. Oh, I think I've uh, made, gone through most of it. Uh, yeah. And it's open source. So, uh, you know, I'm going to put now, it's, I've been using Google Docs, but I'm going to uh, switch to something called Writer Duet which is uh, also free. You can buy a pro version, but the free version, you can have unlimited collaborators on a script, online. So I'm, uh, I've, been, I've been giving feedback to the creator of Write Jude. S so um, uh, he has been implementing s stuff that is very beneficial to collaborate on the script. The Writer Jewett. So WriterJewett.com and then you'll find, um, you know, you, you'll get it formatted. Now it's uh, in the Google Docs. Now I've used uh, this markup language, which is not really very complicated, called Fountain. So that the script is in Fountain format. But you can import the Fountain. So you don't have this uh, centered uh, format. It's uh, left aligned. Uh, and you just write the character in the capital letters and below you write the dialogue and uh, with space you write the action and when you import that to write to do it actually it just um, converts it to a proper uh, script format so we have collaborated in Google Docs uh, but uh, I've tested out write to do it now and it, it looks very good so um, I'm going to switch to that it won't be anonymous collaboration, so people will have to log in. But I think that's good. So, um, and you can comment on it then. I'll allow commenting, but no, no changing in the actual script. But you can write a comment beside 
dialogue or action or whatever and suggests different dialogue or action or whatever and uh, stuff. And also um, do some updates on the website. And, um, and you can go in there, you can log in, and you can read the whole thing, unless you're afraid of spoilers, of course. <laughs> Don't read it. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then you can suggest. Now it's there, it's, it's easier then to suggest and you can, uh, the whole synopsis will be there also, so you can then comment on it in the comments on the, on the website uh, so that you can say, what if Ben rather does this than that? And, da, da, da. Uh, and so that uh, people can actually um, contrib contribute to make this story as as good as possible. At the moment it has a bit top heavy maybe, it's a bit too much before the midpoint, too little after um, working on that, but you know. And then, well I can tell something I forgot, the plan, plan of action uh, was, I'm a bit indecisive at the moment because I've gotten so extremely much feedback from many different people, the, the producer and the, uh, Heather and, and many people um, about what to do. The original plan was to um, arrange a crowdfunding campaign to fund uh, the first 15-20 pages of the script. So we have a plan A and a plan B. Uh, and the plan, plan A would then be to, to shoot this script, this first 20 pages, until Ben wakes up at the future hospital and realizes there are no money. And he wakes up from a nightmare and no! And cut there. So it could stand alone as a short film and then with a cliffhanger. And then make this very low budget in London with uh, unknown actors. Maybe Captain Ian Sarah. Probably. Um, well, Sarah actually won't be there because Awina is not a part of that beginning. Um, and then use this and also maybe make a trailer, so to speak, a fake trailer for the whole movie, so to speak. And then use this to attract f more funding for the whole movie and hopefully, A-listed actors and A-listed, well, A-listed producers, if there's such a thing, and maybe A-listed directors, unless I will be able to do it alone. But I mean, I'm, uh, again, uh, if Steven Spielberg comes and say he'll do it, there you go. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a dream, it's a fantasy, and it's, uh, it's if it ever happens, I shouldn't say this, but I mean, people think it, so why not just say it? It'll be incredible. But uh, things are happening, so it's, it's not impossible. So this is plan A, to make this short film to attract A-listed actors. Keanu Reeves, that's the main part, maybe. <laughs> Keanu Reeves, if you hear this, check out this. <laughs> and... Um, uh, well, we thought about uh, we thought about uh, Meryl Streep as Amel, the old Amel. Uh, Meryl Streep, check it out. And um, as Peter, Kevin Spacey, Kevin Spacey, check it out. <laughs> well, that's Plan A. Plan B is to just continue this uh, movie as a low-budget movie, but with London as a setting with these more unknown actors. Uh, so we kind of get the crowdfunding to shoot the first 20 minutes, and then we can maybe get more crowdfunding to shoot another 20 minutes, and so on, and hopefully then get funding from, you know, funds and investors and stuff, and, and finish it as a more low-budget movie. So that's plan B. So and we kind of... <coughs> that's... I, I, I don't know how much, uh, I don't know the name of it, but this Finnish uh, science fiction humor about the uh, Iron Sky. That was quite fun, wasn't it? Iron Sky, yeah, 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 exactly. Very good point. Because, uh, because I've been actually using Iron Sky as a template for the financing of this. Uh, okay. yeah. 
So I, you know, I, I, I look at Iron Sky and I see, you know, you have this um, fairly unknown Finnish director making Star Wreck, was it? Uh, this 40, 30 minute long uh, Star Trek parody, so to speak. And uh, then getting tel 10 million dollars, I think it was like 8 million euros, to make the Iron Sky. I think it took them like seven years or something to, to get the funding. Uh, and with this Finnish uh, producer, and it, it became, uh, I think it was like uh, Australian production company, and German and Finnish was like three countries involved. Uh, and they got seven million or something from Eurometrics, seven million euros. Um, so, I mean, if they can do it, why can't we, you know? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The budget. Yeah. I mean, to set up. I haven't set. I haven't broken everything down and you know set up a budget. You know, it also depends on the countries that you're in and the the laws and standards of uh, um, you know payment to the different uh, to actors and the, the team and the crew and everything. So it's a lot. You have to calculate. So I haven't put up uh, like a detailed budget, but again, you can use Iron Sky. Iron Sky uh, was a movie with tons of virtual effects, visual effects, and CGI, and about the same uh, cost. And um, I think it was like 55 people in Iron Sky at the moment. It's about 45 in the, in Waking Up. 45 uh, in the cost, in the actors, the characters. And you you need much less CGI and uh, visual effects in in Waking Up. So, you know, when when Iron Sky was made for 10 million, of course I think they you know they had very long days and you know the hour, hourly pay for them wasn't <laughs> wasn't great, but they, they made it, you know, in total. So so uh, I think it, it, it's possible as a minimum. I think also for Waking Up, 10 million dollars or uh, 8 million euros. It's interesting because uh, yeah. Yeah, here, you had a question? No, 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 like a remark. You may want to look at the cosmonaut and that was kind of the The cosmonaut, how it was colorectly made and how it was kind of founded. I can't hear the name of the movie. The cosmonaut. The cosmonaut? Yeah. Ah, I haven't heard about that. Take a note of that. But was that a science fiction movie? I can also thank you for that. End by saying that you know, not only is the script open source, and it has uh, I, I ended up writing most of it, but um, there are elements. There are some scenes, at least a couple, written by uh, another guy who has been, you know, had some ideas that I thought was good, actually funny. Uh, so he kept that there, and also. The most that has come from the community has been feedback and comments that saying that before this story also many of the elements from the earlier ideas were there. So and gotten feedback that you know this doesn't work for the Peter guy, him being like this and that, and then coming with a suggestion. What 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 if he is a former secret agent? That came from. Uh, a, a contributor. I don't know who it is. An anonymous person, or maybe it had, he had a name or something on, on a Google Docs. But uh, then disappearing again, not hearing from that person again. You know, and other people coming with some ideas. Maybe what about this and that? You know. So that's how how the open source collaborative thing has worked during these years, uh, and. Um, now that the first draft, uh, second draft, uh, pretty soon is, is finished, the open source collaborativeness will be kept and continued in the whole project, you know? So that I'll write posts and articles, um, you know, giving people the opportunity to come with suggestions to funding, suggestions to sponsors, suggestions to the costumes, <laughs> locations, uh, animators, uh, you know. And we also got, I also got some extremely surprising emails from some people. Like the, um, uh, 
assembling editor on which movie. <laughs> you know it. Huh? You don't remember it? We, when we saw The Hobbit. Assembling editor on The Hobbit. Emailed me two years ago. Then he was uh, second assistant editor. He found the Waking Up Project interesting, you know. He lives in New Zealand, works for uh, Peter Jackson. <laughs> yeah, things like that has happened. And uh, wondering how it went, you know. And uh, we went to see the, the Last Hobbit, and I looked for him at, in the credits. There he was, Greg Daniels. And uh, I just text, uh, emailed him while I was there. Just saw your last film. I see how become assembling editor. Yes, yes. So he answered me and. Uh, uh, you know, it was great to be the first to put his hands on the material from The Hobbit. He, he was. And he made a rough cut of The Hobbit. None of his edits were used, but anyway, he was uh, actually doing the rough cut. So, um, so hopefully, you know, th things like this will just continue to happen and, and more and more people will uh, find interest in it and... Um, and uh, so I, I still don't see it as my, well, of course it's my movie, but it's, it's not like this. I, th I, I, I hope that, you know, that it can be humanity's movie, actually. Um, so that, because after all it is about creating a new future for us. So, um, and that, you know, maybe we can get crowdfunding, maybe we can get all the funds we need <laughs> from a crowdfunding. You know, if enough people find this, uh, you know, relevant. Any more questions? I think I've been going on now, almost two hours. <laughs> Are we done? I think I'm pretty done. Yeah, then I say, talk for me. Okay.